Alright, how you doing? Alright. You could have had mine. I just want to glance at it. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Alright. Uh-huh. All of them are videos, DVDs, and the, and the um, pictures are on the flash drive. And one of them yours, and the other three can take to him. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Tell him, let me know when you look at it.
Here. 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 Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. This time, uh, are there any things to be added or deleted from the agenda? I understand that Representative Shelly Willingham is here by the presentation. We need to add that to the agenda. Is there anything else? Yes. Yes, sir. Councilman Munn. I'd like to add to two items. One is the 6% COLA increase for all employees who did not receive 5% or more and the company pay study. The second one is a 15% increase for sanitation workers. Council members, would you like to consider that as one, one item or two items? Two. Two. That being said, we have really three items to vote on here tonight. Uh, one is to add Representative Shelley Willingham's presentation to us. I'd like to propose that we do that as item number seven. And then um, there's a 6% COLA increase for those who receive less than 5%. And then number two, 15% sanitation worker increase. So uh, perhaps uh, we should vote on this or we will counsel individually. Individually. All right, that being the case, uh, Representative Shelley Willingham, I need a motion to uh, so move. Second. Motion made by Councilman Joyner, seconded by Councilman Caldridge. Uh, All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. I didn't discuss I'm sorry, did you like to discuss that? No, not that, but I'm <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I thought that would be unanimous, so Councilman. No, no, that's fine. That's good. Okay, item number two is 6 percent COLA increase. For those who receive less than five percent increase, um, we have a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move to table that. Okay, I have a motion and second. Now I have Let's a motion to table it. Um, requires no discussion. I need a second for the table. Second. Second made by Councilman Harris. Uh -huh. um, all those in favor of tabling, say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. No. no. Can I see a hand count? All those in favor of tabling that, please show your hands. Harris, Walker, Daughters, Walker. Uh, so, item matters now tabled. Item number two is 15% sanitation worker increase. Mr. Mayor, I have a discussion. I have a discussion. No, sir, I've not recognized you yet. I'm looking for a motion. I'm, I'm looking, looking for to a table that. Will you recognize? I'm looking for a motion. I believe it'll be tabled. Discussion. Uh, table doesn't require discussion. Well, we have a motion on the floor. I know, so I have a, I need a second to be able to even vote on the table. Second. All right. I have a motion and a second. Discussion. Now I have a motion to table it. Is there a second for the table? I'm not discussing it. I'm not discussing it. Second. Second. Motion second. All those in favor of the table. All those opposed to the table. All those in favor of the table. Point of order. 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 No, 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 sir. Point of order. Okay, fine. Point of order. That requires a majority of the council. I have a comment. 
Uh, I've not recognized you. We've got a table. We've got a second. I call for the vote. All those in favor of disabling the uh, Houston uh, sanitation worker, please say aye. Aye. Uh, All opposed, like sign. Aye. Hand count. May I see a hand count of those who are tabling the 15% sanitation workers, please? Oh, Harris Walker, Daughter Walker. The matter has been tabled. We're now moving on to uh, item number six, which is a community update to City Manager Keith Rogers. Thank you, Mayor. I have a few updates this evening. On tomorrow at the Rocky Mountain Event Center, uh, we will be hosting a community playmaker summit. So you can join speakers and other local government leaders from across the state to share and connect on topics uh, centered around economic development as well as tourism. Uh, you can visit communityplaymaker.com backslash Summit Rocky Mount for more information. Uh, this event is going to begin at 9 a.m. and go to 3 p.m. On Wednesday, our Senior Center Fall Festival will be held from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at the lawn of our historic train station. Uh, for more information on this event, you can reach out to 252-972-1152, uh, but the event will feature a DJ, food trucks, and also have health wellness vendors that are, uh, have services aimed at our senior population. And then on Saturday, November the 11th, is America Recycles Day. And so from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Golden East Crossing Mall parking lot, there will be free, uh, there will be opportunity to donate and recycle confidential documents, electronics, prescription medication, household hazardous waste, and more. So for more information on this event, you can visit our Keep America Beautiful page at RockyMountNC.gov. And also for information about the accepted items, you can call 252-467-4960. Thank you, Mayor. That concludes my update for this evening. I have a point, Mr. Manager. Do you might have any questions or comments for the city manager? Yes. Councilor Knight. Uh, city Manager, what do you plan to introduce to the council and citizens uh, the new positions that have been created outside the um, comp and pay study? Uh, my understanding, we have new uh, employees, and we're not quite understanding the role in those employees about making six figures. And so I think that according to, and I've stated this uh, in the minutes and publicly, uh, the Vision 2 Classification Plan, Section 16-48, Establishment of Classification, which I've also consulted with or conferred with our city attorney. It's the authority to establish new classification position is vested in the city council. The city council will consider the recommendation of the city manager and determine the need for the new classification of position. And those are several positions that have been created. Not saying that they do not, um, but it was not in the budget. And then once the people or the person that was hired, um, they have not been introduced um, to this uh, council as a whole or uh, our um, citizens. Could you please answer that, sir? Certainly, Councilman. No new positions have been created. All the positions that are in this organization are included in the city's classification and compensation plan that was approved most recently in July. And it was only two that was uh, that that you stated when the presentation, and those two was for human resources. Those two positions was the only two in the context that is correct. Councilman, again, those were not new positions. That was additional positions. But all the positions of the city are in the classification and compensation plan that was approved by the council. Okay. And uh, Mayor, could I we ask our city clerk to pull those minutes? Uh, when I asked that question, and it was verified uh, at a particular time at the council meeting. Or if you go and pull those notes and send those around. And, and one last thing, I've been asking for some um, public uh, requests. Uh, I'm still trying to get the information, how many vacancies that we have in our police department. I've gone to our chief, I've gone to Kirk Brown, our public relations, uh, going to HR, uh, going to the manager, I still have not received it, and it's been going over approximately two months. 
some other things I've requested and I still have not received it. Uh, some ask, I'm talking, some asking uh, our attorney, uh, Mr. Rose, what do, as a council member, if we cannot get information from our public relations director, Mr. Brown, or from our human relations, not human relations, human resource uh, director, and you cannot get it from the city manager. Uh, do we need to send that uh, request to you as our attorney to get that public uh, information? Could you please I, I do not have that information. So how do we request it? Do we request it through you to get it? You can request it through the city manager. And if I, we don't get it, then what? That's between you, that's between the council and the city manager. And last question, if a <coughs> citizen requests a public request record and, and does not get it, what does a citizen do? Is by right that they can get this information? What is your legal um, answer on that, sir? If a public citizen does not get a record that is a public record, City refuses to give it, he can take the city to court, or she can take the city to court. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Anybody else? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. I think it's worth noting that um, in our packet for committee, the whole that we have today that was delivered to us by the police department on Friday and uploaded to the city website, on page 13, of uh, Chief Housel's presentation today, it states January we had 52 vacancies, negative hiring numbers of two plus years. As of October, we have 15 vacancies, 13 in BLET, and positive hiring numbers for current year to date. So I would like the record to state that we do have that information and it's in our packet if we would have read it. And um, I will get a presentation to me the whole today. Thank you, Councilman Harris. What about the other questions that were asked? Uh, I'll follow that. I believe the mayor called on me. He did. I'll follow that. So I'll just ask the speaker. Sure. Thank you. Councilman Daughters covered exactly what I was going to uh, say. That information of vacancies is in our packet, which uh, Chief Hassel will be discussing with us in the committee as a whole. Uh, it's good to, to go over your information prior to each meeting. Mm. Councilman Blackwell. Thank you. Mm. So, what is our protocol? We had those discussions in prior administrations before uh, um, I was sanctioned once. Conversations about transparency over the last six, seven years. So many conversations about um, having open information and discussion. And it's so interesting um, that um, things have really changed since uh, perspective and leadership on this council has changed. So, what is the expectation of city council members? Public, when we ask questions to have our answers directed to us individually mm -hmm. as well as corporately, and what is the public able to know about the business that is funded by the public? What, what is the standard, and what is acceptable, and what is unacceptable? To the mayor and to the manager. Well, the mayor doesn't get a chance to set those policies along with the market, so, uh, you know, uh, it, my expectation is that it should be public information. Mayor. Uh, Council Mike. The manager has to be the manager. You want to address that? Would you like to address that with the manager? Well, Councilman, I, I reach out to every council member before every council meeting. Uh, I have one-on-one -on -one meetings with every council member, uh, so there is, in my opinion, no if, issue with council members receiving information, so I'm not understanding tonight's question. Council Monty? Yeah, I just want to make this last comment. That it was in our committee to hold as of Friday, and the reason why I stated that, if you go in the record, that it's been over two months prior to Friday. 
So I just want to make sure my point was clear. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to item number seven on the agenda. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Rector to show the way down for a comment. Say a few words. information that I want to share with the council and also uh, share with the public. Uh, over the last week or two, well, last week especially, I've been getting a number of calls uh, personally in my home, in my cell, and also uh, in my office uh, from my constituents uh, in Edgecombe County. And it's just something that I was not aware of, so I just wanted to address that to make you aware of. And I made a couple of notes here just to throw on, throw on the media and throw on my remarks, but just something that I wanted to point out uh, to the council and, and to the public. Uh, and, and it came about, what it was about was about this $8.5 million that the city is receiving from the General Assembly. Uh, let me make it clear, first of all, this money is from the General Assembly, it's not from the governor, it's not from anybody else. The, the other thing is that this allotment is through, the city of Rock and Out is through the 23rd district. I represent the 23rd district in the house. And the district covers all of Edgecombe County, all of Martin County, and all of uh, uh, Bertie. Now, the city, my district, only covers the Edgecombe part of Rock and Out. The money is allocated to Rockin' Out 23rd District, Edge Road side. That's one point. The other point is that I was told, well, everybody who called me said that they wonder why I didn't have anything to do with the money coming to Rockin' Out. That's not true. I'm the one who advocated for this money for the city. And I'm the one responsible for the money coming to the city. There was no allocation or no advocation on the part of any Nash County uh, delegation to get this money. As a member, as a member of the uh, budget conference committee, I know what came in. I know who made requests. So. My constituents were telling me that uh, for their, I had nothing to do with it. But I just want you to know that that's not true. That is not true. In addition to that, the money, uh, the leadership at the time, and I'll say this publicly, the leadership said they didn't like the concept of actors to construct or the city being responsible for the judicial center. Saying that. Still, my application was for money for the, uh, for the city, the edge home side, and really was for affordable housing. That was my main push, because that's something that I don't get the point of. Now, the money was allocated, and what I suggested was that we take part of the money, and we use part of that money to go to, uh, I guess, kind of a smaller down payment and helping the city uh, construct the judicial center. But my suggestion was that $4.5 million go to affordable housing, housing, and then the other $4 million would go toward the judicial center. And so I just want to make it clear, you know, that I represent District 23, I represent Edgecombe County, and, and I can take credit for something that's on National outside, but I want to, but that's not the way I do business. That's not the way I work. Um, and, and just to, uh, just as an example, we got the DMV in here. Nobody heard me talk about I had anything to do with it. Well, I did, but that's just rocking out. And I'm going to 
going to support Port City because this is where I live. This is my hometown. I'm going to do that. I'm going to support the area. I'll support Nash County if that's what it needs, if we can get something here. But just at the point that I'm trying to make is that I sit on what they call the Appropriations Transportation Committee. And we're the ones who make the decisions whether uh, transportation gets the money to make this move. And we had to fight for that. The only reason we got it, not the only reason, but one of the major reasons we got it was that there was another legislator who happens to have lived in Nash County for a while. And myself, we are up to this because Wake County was not about to let the BMD go. But we were successful. And, and certainly there were other people involved in this. So I don't you know, claim that I brought the BMD uh, here. But I did have some. But the thing is, is that I want to make sure that the public knows, and especially the people in my district know, that this man was advocated on your behalf to have affordable housing in his county. And also, uh, to just let you know how the budget process operates, every member has an opportunity to ask for anything. And we got 120 members in the House and 50 members of the Senate. They can ask for things, they can, but uh, that's something else for them to get. Uh, so you can imagine how much we ask for, even though we have a $30 billion budget. Uh, that's really not a lot of money when you think about all the people, all the needs that we have. I have over 30 some talent in my district. Like enough, I'm not the only one. So that means that everybody's asking for something. But naturally, I'm going to try to do as much as I can for my hometown and my county. Mm -hmm. And so it worked out. But the other thing, too, is that we've been fortunate over the years. Uh, last two or three budget terms, of course, I've been fortunate enough to serve on the uh, conference committee. And the conference committee is when the House and the uh, Senate can agree and they come together and people are selected to serve the committee to work out and to agree on something that comes out that everybody can vote on. So I've been fortunate to be on that committee. So again, as I said, I'm aware of what is asked for and I know what it's given for. So my closing thing is this, is that, as I said, uh, my suggestion was that 4.5 million was for affordable housing and 4 million for the uh, judicial center. And of course, uh, and I'm sure everybody on the council knows, and I'm sure all of the ministers here know, that when money is allocated, it can only be spent for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And if it's not spent for that purpose, then that is called misappropriation of state funds, and that's against the law. So I'm just, like I said, normally, I mean, I feel awkward having to make this, these comments, but I just want to make clear, you know, that uh, you know, I'm working for, this is not a campaign. I, I'm, of course, I'm looking for my constituents. I'm trying to do what they ask me to do. And, and I, I'll just say, I'll sit down. Uh, for my district, the three times I had, I was able to get close to $50 million. So there are other monies that we got there from county. But here again, I'm not here to brag about what I did because that's not me. The thing is, though, I want you to understand that I'm working every day with the people in H1 County and the city of Rocky Mountain, the whole area. Uh, it's going to count as third, and of course, the uh, city of Rocky Mountain is right there with me. So I, I just want to make that clear, and, and I, and again, uh, like I said, I apologize for even, even have to say this, but I, I think it's important I can answer this publicly and don't have to try to answer all these phone calls or something, uh, you know, answer me these questions. I can't answer them. I, my, I got, 200 calls on my home phone that I would never phone anymore. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I'm just saying, this is a small thing, but it's something that I think we need to be aware of. And, and I, I appreciate you letting me speak. And of course, if you have any questions, I'm going to answer them. Representative William, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for advocating on behalf of the city. <laughs> thank you for clearing up this particular issue. Like I say, in my own mind, there was some confusion on about it. And anything I've done to uh, misrepresent that, I Certainly never my intent, and I do appreciate mm -hmm. you coming and clearing this up. Uh, you've been a strong advocate for us in Rocky Mountain through the years. I know you continue to be, but frankly, I think you all grappled about what we want the best 
Resolution of the City Council of the City of Rock County recognizing and honoring the streets and stormwater division for saving the life of a fellow employee. Whereas on Wednesday, the 30th day of August, 2023, an express staffing employee, Rayford Odom, suffered a medical emergency and collapsed in cardiac arrest while working in a ditch located near Pineview Street. And whereas the City of Rock County employees, Dwayne Pride and Nathaniel Pittman and Keith Kenneth Winstead, and employees of the Express staffing, Denitra Gray, Melvin Cotton, Donovan Jones, realizing that Mr. Odom was in extreme distress, led into action providing aid to Mr. Odom. And whereas the employee feared the scene and station employee and see truck on the street near the work site for emergency personnel to easily locate the site while Mr. Pride called uh, 911. And whereas Mr. Pride received CPR instruction from the dispatcher, which he called out to Mr. Gary. They began administering CPR, and then the two men worked in unison administering the CPR to Mr. Odom until the arrival of emergency personnel. Whereas the first responders rendered aid to Mr. Odom for several minutes, reviving him on the scene and then transporting him to National Hospital, where he was then airlifted to Duke Medical Center, underwent emergency surgery, and is now at home expected to make a full recovery. And whereas the heroic action taken by the streets and stormwater employees and the express staffing employees, when they realized that Mr. Odom was in medical stress and the follow-up actions taken by the fire department team saved Mr. Odom's life 
and the City Council wishes to recognize and honor the city employees who work together to accomplish this result. And now therefore be it resolved that by the City Council, by the City Council of the City of Rocky Mount, that it recognizes, honors, and expresses heartfelt thanks to Dwayne Pride, Nathaniel Pippen, Kenneth Winstead of the Street and Stormwater Division, and the employees of Express Staffing of Demetri Gray, Melvin Cotton, and Donovan Jones for the heroic action they took on the 30th day of August of 2023 to save the life of their fellow employee, Rayford Odom. Adopted this the 23rd day of October of 2023. This proclamation from the City of Rocky Mount, whereas the Wilson Rocky Mount Harbor Chapter of the Leagues Incorporated was chartered on April 18th of 1948, and whereas the Leagues Incorporated was organized on the pillars of friendship and service and hosted membership exceeding 17,000 professional women of African descent throughout the United States, Commonwealth of the Bahamas, and the United Kingdom. And whereas the Wilson Rocky Mount Harbor Chapter of the Leagues Incorporated has conducted forums on substance abuse for local schools and ho hosted health awareness webinars. And whereas the Wilson Rock Mount Harbor chapter has demonstrated their commitment to education by collaborating, collaborating with the Children Learning Center to provide tutoring for low performing students, sponsoring summer reading programs for elementary students, 
and donating books to local Head Starts. And whereas the Wilson Rocky Mount Harbor Chapter of the Lynx has provided community support by sponsoring financial workshops for students and providing scholarships to graduating high school students attending HBCUs, and whereas the Wilson Rock Mount Tormer Chapter, The Lynx Incorporated, has continued to the commitment to the implementation of national programs by promoting civic education and health initiatives that improve the quality of life of the communities they serve. Now, therefore, I, as the mayor of the city of Rock Mount, do hereby proclaim October 29th of 2023 as the Wilson Rock Mount Tormer, North Carolina Chapter of The Lynx Incorporated, 75th Anniversary Celebration Day and the city of Rocky Mountain call upon all the citizens to join in celebrating this organization and the value it brings to our community. The witness thereof, I have, I have hereunto set my hand in the seal of the city of Rocky Mountain this 25th day of October, So, finally, the proclamation of the city of Rocky Mount. Whereas on October 2023 marks the 78th anniversary of National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And whereas the purpose of National Disability Employment Awareness Month, Awareness Month is to educate about, dis about disability employment issues and celebrate the many and varied contributions of America's workers with disabilities. And whereas the history of the National Disability Employment Awareness Month traces back to 1945, and Congress enacted a law declaring the first week in October each year National Employee of the Physically Handicapped Week. Whereas in 1962, the word physically was removed to acknowledge the employment needs and contributions of individuals with all types of disabilities. Whereas in 1988, Congress expanded the week to a month and changed the name to National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And whereas workplaces welcoming the talents of all people, including people with disabilities, are a critical part of our efforts to build an inclusive community and strong economy. And whereas activities during this month will reinforce the value and talent people with disabilities add to our workplaces and communities and affirm Rocky Mountain, North Carolina's commitment to an inclusive community that increases access and opportunities to all, including individuals with disabilities. Now, therefore, I, as by virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2023 as Disability Employment Awareness Month and call upon all employers, schools, and other community organizations in our city to observe this month with appropriate programs and activities to advance the important message that people with disabilities add value and talent to the workplace and community. And be it further resolved that the City of Rocky Mountain, North Carolina pledges to continue to take steps throughout the year to recruit, hire, retain, and advance individuals with disabilities and work to pursue the goals of opportunity, full participation, economic self-sufficiency, and independent for living with people with disabilities. And with this hereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the City of Rocky Mountain, North Carolina to be affixed this 23rd day of October of the year of 2023.
This brings us to item number eight on our agenda, which are petitions to be received from the public. Public petitions portion of the city council meeting is an opportunity for public comment, and the city council appreciates your attendance and thanks you for expressing your views and opinions. The city council values all citizen input. This is an opportunity to raise a question or present a request to council. However, in most cases, council members will not respond to public comments, but may refer a matter to the city manager or staff to follow. Time will be monitored in order to give everyone an opportunity to speak, and speakers will have three minutes. Please be aware that sign sheets must be presented to the security officer prior to the opening of the city council meeting. And if an organized group is present to speak on a community common issue, please designate one person to present the group's comments. If your comments in regard to an item that is the subject of a public hearing, please wait until that item is introduced to speak. Time will also be monitored. If your comments are in regard to an evidentiary hearing, additional time may be granted. The City Council requests that you please adhere to the following guidelines. Complete the sign-in sheet, address comments to the Council as a whole, and not to individual Council members or City staff. Speak to the podium in a civil, non-argumentative, and respectful manner. Personal attacks which have the potential to disrupt the meeting will not be tolerated, and you will be asked to sit down or be removed from the meeting. Keep comments to three minutes. This time I'd like to invite Mr. Richard Petway to the podium. about a fair pay for the city workers who you just got to give any plaque for. <laughs> now, it's amazing wow. how you can give a plaque for, being a, uh, for doing that which they deserve. But they also deserve a fair pay. <laughs> you done had 90 days one time to, to bring this uh, petition to the floor. Then you had another time to do it. Now you want to table it again. How many times you gonna let the city employee eat baloney by all these states? <laughs> it's not worth it. Now, we have so many people here that walked out the city council meeting on the last time we had it. I'm not gonna call your name because you know, and you should be ashamed. You should be ashamed because you are here to represent the city of Rocky Mountain and its constituent in your community. And you are here to do your job. But when you walk out of a city council meeting and not let the people voice their opinion, you all you're doing is sitting up there doing the same thing you're doing now. You're not saying anything to us, but you just listen. And that's all we want you to do, listen. But we want you to do it. Andre Knight brought this. Same thing up again, 15 to 10 and 6. You tailor it. Now, you are given, this has been given over and over time about this. When are y'all going to wake up and say, no, these employees do need a raise? They knew, they knew they do need a more than a dollar and 63 cent raise. Mm. They do need that. But when you can take the top, mm. 10% and give them $60,000, $70,000, $80,000 and make their salary go up to $120,000, $170,000 and you can't even reach down and pull the bottom up. And all they have asking for is 20, 25%. But yet still you sit up there and you want to give out a flight for what they do and you're not giving out enough. I want to commend 
those who are sitting on the couch of the day for coming, coming back to their job. <laughs> I want to commend you today, but I want to thank Ruben Blackwell, Andre Knight, and Ray Jonah for, for being here. Even the secretary was here. It's a shame when you had the secretary take the Thank you, thank you, Mr. Pettelon. I will remind everybody this is a business meeting, and you know I do appreciate uh, the folks being excited. But uh, please, it's not an interactive kind of context. It's just to get I'm not here, right? I'm not. I know you're not. I not. I wasn't talking to you, Mr. Pettelon, but I do thank you for your comments. Very much. You're talking about me, and I got to let you know. All right. Thank you. Continues that I may have to clear the chamber. Just let me know. I'd like to invite. I'd like to invite Mr. Rashid Muhammad to the podium. Mr. Rashid Muhammad. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you move here. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> continually uh, provide those services regardless of whether they get in the prayer pad or not. Um, I, ask, I would like to ask, is there a tentative plan that we have considered? Um, because it sounds like this is not a new issue. Uh, these uh, parameters around how, that, how the employees uh, would either receive pay and on uh, merit raises, have that been disclosed to them so that they would understand either how they should get those merits or what is it that they need to do in order to get those merits and what's keeping them from those merits. Um, typically that's something um, that should have been shared um, when a person is either hired and or uh, if they're demanding or, or, or have earned something, those, those um, particular um, parameters should have been discussed. But I think we have a great city and you guys are trying to make a difference. And I think one of the things that we all have to look at is uh, the environment is all the city you have. When you have a group of people that can uh, consciously uh, do the best job they can regardless of whether they have been a five-year employee, a 10-year employee, or a 15-year employee. It's obviously based on commitment. Um, of course, we do know that the value of life in many cases is actually increased by the opportunity for us to gain um, merit, uh, whether that's financially, our status, or for some of us in different ways, uh, what matters the most. I say to you, as I would say to myself, the slogan, City on the Rise, has to be taken seriously. If it, if it is for us as a group to improve the living standard, that we should all be asking for, insisting upon, and contributing to, because all of us pay taxes. So my money. Thank you, Mr. Mom. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, sir. I'd like to invite Dr. Koo to the podium. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Koo. 
Kuhn. I'm a member of the Rocky Mountain Racial Justice Group, in the name of Humanity and Community Academy for Affordable Housing. It has been brought to my attention that the North Carolina General Assembly has given the city $8.5 million for housing and a future judicial center. Without public discussion, we are told that $5 million has already been allocated for the judicial center, leaving $3.5 million for affordable housing. Why is this council always putting useless buildings and structures ahead of people? Mm. Obviously, you do not seem to care that people here are struggling. The case in point being city workers fighting for equitable raises so they can survive in these hard times. The city workers are only asking for raises in keeping with the police and fire department. The judicial center is a redundant structure, given that both Ashland County and Nash County have courthouses. We do not need it. The cost of it has risen from 20 to 35 million. Reasons like more parking lots or more traffic generating money are bogus. Because that money comes from fines and dunning poor people for minor infractions and not for actual useful goods and services. The 8.5 million can best be used for people anytime, all time. No more of the same hackneyed cry of fiscal responsibility, an excuse and a cudgel constantly being raised when people is requested when money is requested for people projects. Why are you not making lifting people out of poverty your priority? You should, you should be using all the $8.5 million for affordable housing as one avenue. Mm -hmm. Your behavior echoes the federal government with its irresponsible spending, using billions to fund overseas wars while inside this country, people are languishing from poverty, homelessness, ill health and addiction and our infrastructure is crumbling. Right now, today, if you have any conscience at all, instead of business as usual, you all should be up in arms about impending genocide on the 2.2 million people in Gaza and demanding that our government support an immediate ceasefire to allow humanitarian aid to reach the people inside and for conflicting parties to negotiate for a just and lasting settlement. The global majority is doing so. Why aren't you? Since we do not live in a vacuum, I suggest that council draft a resolution, stop this madness in the Middle East, demand an immediate ceasefire, and allow humanitarian aid to Gaza. Thank you. Thank you. Right. 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 Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Susan Perry Cole, and I'm a resident of the City of Rocky Mountain. I'm speaking this afternoon to share recommendations on behalf of some Rocky Mountain taxpayers regarding how an allocation of $8.5 million in state funding granted to the city by the North Carolina General Assembly should be used. It is my understanding that the allocation approved by state legislators could be used to help pay for affordable housing in Rocky Mountain and a future judicial center downtown but that the matter must go before the City Council to develop a consensus on an expenditure plan to determine the specific use of the funds. I am today expressing strong support for use of the entire $8.5 million state appropriation to further solutions to housing affordability <coughs> crisis that are tangible, impactful, and achievable. Alarming housing market trends in North Carolina and, and nationally include rise, rising mortgage rates, elevated home prices, and the persistent shortage of resale housing inventory, especially entry-level supply, all of which are the factors perpetuating the housing affordability crisis in the United States. Given these current real estate market conditions, including the national average 30-year home mortgage interest rate, which soared to 7.63%, the third week of October, I highlight two examples of housing recommendations that are capable of making an impact. According to a recent North Carolina Realtors Market Report, statewide, the median sales price for a home in North Carolina was $302,549 in April 2023, an annual increase of 4.4%. Down payment assistance is one program <coughs> that has the potential to overcome a lack of savings and intergenerational wealth, which represents one of the most significant barriers to buying a home, and is a consequence of the historical barriers to home ownership among black and other people of color households. 
an expanded and well-crafted city-funded down payment assistance program could provide up to $50,000 for qualifying first-generation home buyers to meet these stakeholders' needs for cash at closing. The intervention of $50,000 in down payment assistance would go a long way toward removing a significant barrier to black and other historically disadvantaged households that could increase their home ownership rates in the city. Another example, other jurisdictions like Raleigh are preserving the availability of existing affordable housing opportunities for homeowners who meet certain criteria, who can qualify for up to $90,000 to be used for home repairs. Such funding must be sent to fix issues that represent a threat to life, safety, or health of the occupant to include repairs to roofs, plumbing, electrical, or heating systems. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you Thank for you. the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'd like to invite Ms. Gomez to the podium. members, ladies and gentlemen, the world is in a turmoil. There is a humanitarian crisis here in the U.S. and a humanitarian crisis abroad. But we have chosen to fund the crisis abroad, while here we ignore the pitiful plight that our people are suffering. Have you heard that untold billions of your tax dollars are sent to, fu to fight wars in Ukraine? And now, the Middle East and possibly the biggest one yet to come with nuclear power with China. Aren't you ashamed that funding for healthcare has been drastically reduced in the face of rising diseases of despair, opioid addiction, suicide, depression, etc., and you say nothing when your tax dollars fund genocide at occupation and apartheid? Aren't you ashamed that food programs for poor families, both black and white, with children have been severely reduced to enable your tax dollars to purchase bombs, <clears throat> tanks, missiles, and your tax dollars <coughs> help to widen wars with mass killing of civilians. And you say nothing about that. Aren't you ashamed that you refuse to give a living wage to the sanitation workers? I said living wage, not equal pay while you allow our elected officials to ship billions of dollars to fund bloody wars that we have not won since the Vietnam War. <laughs> Aren't you ashamed that we have sent someone over to Ukraine to look into rebuilding Ukraine, when here homelessness is expanding every day, everywhere? Mm. They say, don't bite the hand that feeds you. I say, this is the time to bite the hand that feeds you. <laughs> Poverty misery, death, disease, etc. Do not ask, where is the money? Do not talk about fiscal responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Arnie Jones to the podium. Council members, mayor, city, uh, city manager. Um, I'm going to just start off by saying I have a petition that I'd like to present to the council of uh, names that back the 15% and in our, in our department sanitation is greater and, and the 6% code. We need this money. And time and time again, we come here, I come here, my co-workers come here. Things fall on deaf ears. When y'all will ever stand up and do what's right? Have some that, that that's willing to step up and out of the box to help us. Some of you sit back, whatever that may be, President President Van Dam, whatever it is, that's wrong. We 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 are here. We do a job every day, and it, it, I applaud that you gave a blackout and to the to the street. They deserve it. That's true. But like I said, we all need to stand in this together. The whole, the whole situation, not just us by ourselves. 
But I come here to speak tonight. Turn it down again, once again. We come here once again, several times. We come here. When other departments can just get it, just like me. No category. We have families to feed. We have bills to pay. But you do when we do a magnificent job for the city. And the city stands behind us 100%. Every presenter that came with me tonight, I applaud them speaking up for us. But it's time for us to do something in them. It's time for us to stand together and, and to set to them and to see what we can do. But we, we, we do a good job. We, we, we're, we're over here doing all kinds of, all kind of fest, fest uh, diseases and whatnot. We still have vacancies in our department as well as other departments. We're not a full staff, but we get out here and do it every day to try to make that happen for every resident in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, Edge Cone and Edge County. And it just, it just says me that we can't, we can't get what we deserve and what we need. And, and, and it's about time, I know you shared it tonight, and that's sad, it really, it really hurts me to my heart. I'm just saying for myself, it hurts me to my heart. It hurts my coworkers that has family, has bills, like everyone in here has bills. But when are we gonna do something right for a change for this department. We've been fighting for years. And it's not just six, seven years. It's been sometimes 20 years. We haven't anything ever happened good for us. But well, a few trucks, a few trains. But that pay ain't never changed. We can't live our wages 20 years ago to what it, what it is today. But I have nothing. Thank you, sir. That's fine. Right. Thank you. I'd like to invite Nathan O'Ree to the podium. show up for people that are paying them. Now I'm a citizen of Rocky now and when I come to city council meetings and I've been coming for quite a few years now and different ones have been absent but they were present virtually and that was you know the best that they could do and in my heart had some peace with that but the last city council meeting was shameful and there should be some apologies to the citizens yes. and to your own employees. So I didn't hire these sanitation workers. But you know, somebody should say, well, I'm sorry, you know, apologize. Somebody should say something because you love us. But if you don't love us, you can talk all the talk you want to. Mm -hmm. But we are watching your walk. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, Actions speak louder than words. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And going forward from this point, going forward, I'm encouraging you. You may not like it, but sometimes I don't like my husband. But you know what? I love him. And therefore, I'm accountable to my husband. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ari. I'd like to invite Clay Turner to the podium. Good evening, Good evening, City Council members, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Manager. What we've seen here tonight uh, makes me say shame. Mm -hmm. Shame. Mm -hmm. Shame. 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 I was here at the last meeting, and I think it's I think it's a little bit funny that we're sitting here talking about emptying, emptying this chamber. Mm. When y'all emptied the chamber last time, and we were all here, Amen. and I know that the rules of the quorum of this city council of this city council meeting have come into effect since the majority showed up today. So I'm not going to direct any comments at any individual members or staff. Uh, but I would encourage folks to go back, no minutes, but their recordings, watch that meeting. I'm going to give uh, a little reading so I can stick with some of the core rules. Um, this is from Proverbs. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it. Mm -hmm. When it is in your power to act, do not say to your neighbor, come back later. I'll give it tomorrow. When you have it with you now. Mm. And let's be clear. We are tabling motions to give a fair wage to sanitation workers, to give a cost of living increase to city workers who didn't receive a substantial raise. But we are tabling those motions trying to instead shirk out political responsibility because y'all work for us. And if political spinelessness, mm. moral cowardice, mm. were disqualifying for office, this council would look a lot different. Mm. the rest of my time to make a public records request to the manager and the city attorney uh, for everything council member Mike requested. My name is Henry Clay Turner. I live at 706 East Grand Avenue. Happy to get my phone number. Happy to come here and inspect those records before the next council meeting or anytime that's convenient or to have them delivered to me. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite city needs to the podium. City needs. Long. Um, oh, sorry. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm actually very glad that the day is this full today because uh, it wasn't here when I was here two weeks ago. Um, and I'm not going to be long, um, but you know, Councilman Knight um, mentioned earlier about um, overlooking and disrespecting Representative Shelley Birmingham, and then you know, public works were presented with. And maybe they weren't overlooked for the great work that they did in saving a life, um, but they are being overlooked in what you all are tabling to discuss behind closed doors, which in which the public has continued to ask you for, um, and to discuss it here publicly. Um, and it saddens me when you know you all are elected officials and you know have made this issue or since call, called to say that this issue is a political issue, when in fact the fire department came in April and public works came and spoke and said they wanted a raise in April, but filing was in July. Um, so I'm not sure how this is a political issue per se, um, but you all are elected officials and so we vote for you. Mm -hmm. And so we vote for you to do the work in which you're supposed to do. Um, and I don't think that it's been 
presented in the last months. Um, and for those that walked out on the people two weeks ago, shame on you. And I hope that you are sleeping well at night knowing that you are giving a dollar raise to people to feed their families, to feed them with Thanksgiving coming up, to give a little joy to their families with Christmas coming up. I hope you I hope you can feed your family off of a dollar and eighty three cents. Cause I know I can. I can't even feed myself off a dollar on a dollar. So I hope you are proud of yourselves. And just because you were just reelected doesn't mean you will be re reelected mm. in four years. Thank mm. you. Thank you. All right. Well, I'd like to invite Christopher Edwards to the podium. Good evening. I would like to take the time to address the city council members and the mayor who walked out on us and the manager. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to say welcome back. <laughs> but we don't feel the welcome for you, you all when you all are tabling discussions that needs to really be heard within this community. Um, I don't think it's right for you all to take your majority or political pack or whatever you all want to call yourself and suppress issues that really need to be voted on. So I know uh, the city attorney said that and made it public knowledge that if you all keep missing these scheduled meetings that you all can be, um, I don't know the proper term, but if you can clarify what you did mention last time about them not attending the meeting, they could be arrested and held in contempt. And I do think that needs to be more addressed publicly because we the people will not tolerate you all's foolishness no more. Because it's just downright disrespectful to see y'all walk out with smiles on y'all faces and today y'all tabling issues like it's all good and it's not. So you all need to have a little private meeting, get y'all train of thought together. So that way, the next time y'all come, y'all address the people of the city of Rocky Mount correctly. But the disrespect 
The United States many times, I've been to this council longer than anybody sitting up there beside us there attorney. I've seen a whole lot of things, but I haven't seen no mess like this right here. <laughs> it is sad. Yeah. And I've documented, I was busy doing me before the pandemic, like I said before. I had to rush here for my job at 3.30. Because I want the people to see what's going on. And definitely glad I was here when y'all walked out. <laughs> oh, that. Mm. I wouldn't even took no money for that if I was going to pay. Y'all have to Brings us on item number nine on our agenda, which is consent agenda. Move for a motion to adopt the consent agenda as written. So moved. Motion made by Councilman Joyner. Is there a second? Second. Made by Councilman Harris. Is there a need for discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, white sign. Motion carries. Brings us item number 10, which is a public hearing. It's relevant to the fiscal year 2023, section. 5310, 5311, 5339, Community Transportation Program grants for funding to the North Carolina Department of Transportation. will fund a portion of administrative, operating, and capital expenses deferred by the Department of Transit for total funding of $2,069,182, local match being $245,433. At this time, is there somebody here from uh, staff that wants to speak to this before we open up the public comment? All right. Uh, hearing none, uh, I would like to at this point in time invite anybody from the public who would like to uh, come and speak to this particular matter. Is there anyone here who would like to speak to the matter relative to, to uh, fiscal year 2023, section 5310, 5311, and 5339 community transportation program grants? I hear none. I'll close now the public uh, comments portion. This time I'll entertain a motion to adopt a resolution and authorize city manager. Motion made by Councilman Joyner. Is there a second? Second. Second made by Councilman uh, Harris. Is there a need for discussion? Yes. Yes, sir. Councilman Blackwell. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if in this, um, this, uh, this discussion of the micro uh, strategy that we've been talking about. Um, and I appreciate the conversation and discussion, but I also just want to clarify that this is nothing new in the city of Rocky Mountain. Um, we had proposals submitted years ago that we did not follow through or followed up on or neglected or killed. I don't know what it was. I appreciate that we're getting ready to go into a community hall meeting now, but we had an opportunity before Wilson did it. Innovation came from a young black man, and I hate to think that decisions were made around race, and I hope they were not. But what I do know is that I never received an answer. I never received an answer. What I heard is that we would further study. And now we're about to have a conversation about following another city that we had the opportunity to lead it in. So I'm thankful that we're looking at other, other options. I'm disappointed about our process and people. And um, and um, I also, and I'll, I'll leave it that. I'll leave it that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilman Blackwell. I, I don't believe this particular matter has anything to do with the proposal or the discussion of the community hall. Thank you. But I understand um, directly that. Yeah. But I, I just want to levy that here because I don't want to take that into a meeting with somebody that didn't have anything to do with what we do. I understand. Right? I have a motion. I have a second. Is there any other discussion? Are you not all in favor? Please say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carries. At this time, are there any appointments to be brought before the uh, city comment. council? I, I want to make a comment before you close out. Well, uh, I have not recognized you have called for appointments. You have an appointment, Council Knight. No, I do not. Does anybody have any appointments to be made in item number 11? Okay. Yes, my, what's the nature of your comments? The nature of my comment, uh, just listening to the citizens and the public comment. comment. I'll I recognize you. I'll recognize you. Yes, my. Okay. I just want to say that um, I hope the council will go back and consider uh, the information that we have heard from our citizens. And uh, the holidays are coming up Thanksgiving and Christmas. We are expecting that. So I would like this council to at least consider um, the 6% COVID increase for our employees who did not receive anything. 
It should not have to wait for a new year, 2024. And I know that the 15% was a standoff against Ruben, Richard, and myself. I understand that it's a standoff for the three. But at least give the employees who did not receive anything from this conversation this year to make it right. Uh, the holidays are coming up. The winter is coming in. It's right, it's right. And not withhold that from them until 2024. They say in 2024, you see the 2% to 4%, but it was already in the budget with the mere increases anyway. But give the employees the 6%. That's the right thing to do. Then we'll come back and discuss the 15%. But that is a standoff, and I understand that. Majority of rules. Thank you. Thank you. Meetings now adjourned. Hey, how you doing? All right. Hey, I gotta even know that with you. Yeah, come on. All right, yeah. What's up, man? What's up? black man, I was, I was um, taught to speak to folk, but look at who you walk around the room speaking to, the Boris Walker, um, the, the mayor and the city manager, how you doing man, good to see you, but that's cause Max is um, coaching these boys on anyway, um, Jay Kelly and let me know what to that day that I want to pull the big in. Oh yeah, he, he, he was the one. That's the one I was talking about. Okay. Interesting.
to our committee of the whole meeting, Monday, October 23rd. Our time is approximately 5.30 p.m. Thank you for everyone being here, uh, all of our council members, colleagues, the staff, uh, to all constituents that are here present today for our committee of the whole. We have two agenda items on the day. Uh, first and foremost, let me congratulate um, all of our council members that were just recently reelected. Uh, council member Knight, Ward 1, congratulations. Councilman Daltrich, Ward 5, congratulations. And um, Councilman Ward. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, but I, I, I was looking around at everyone else to make sure I had everyone. And uh, the mayor race that is now currently in a uh, runoff race which will conclude November the 7th. Um, so again, thank you um, to Councilman Joyner and to all of you. And congratulations to everyone who was reelected. Looking forward to uh, the next four years of, of work. At this time now, I want to uh, move us to agenda item number one, which is the microtransit presentation. Uh, I just got back from uh, the islands and uh, I thought I brushed up on some of my uh, names, but I failed to uh, have this name pronounced before, so uh, I'm gonna try my best. Um, but uh, to, Mar am I, Marietta? Marietta. Marietta Echevry. Marietta. Marietta Echevry. Yes. Is that close yeah. enough? Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ms. Marietta. I'll now turn over uh, our agenda item for the micro transit presentation to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. So my name is Maria de Echeverri. I'm a consultant for ACOM, a senior transportation planner. I have been with the firm for seven years, and, uh, and I, I am the project manager for this project. So um, thank you for inviting me today. So the first thing uh, in the agenda is the study goals. Um, we were approached by the city of Portimao and CDOT to develop to look at the feasibility of implementing microtransit um, in the city. So that was kind of the overall goal uh, for us. And of course, when we first came, um, we saw that you have a very strong fixed route system. So you, you, you currently operate fixed route. And we saw the need to look at what your fixed route is doing to see if microtransit fits in that. You know, in, in that entire picture. So that was another goal of the study was to look how this system is fully integrated and it is just functional. Um, we look at the kitchen condition. The kitchen condition. And, uh, very strong public engagement. And then we crafted the recommendations and the financial plan. And the So um, what is my process? All of you may be familiar with Uber and Lyft. Microtransit is similar to Uber and Lyft, but um, it operates for uh, transit specifically. And, and microtransit offers share rides, so you can typically what you do is that uh, you have an app on your phone, you select uh, your destination where you want to go, and then they tell you when they are going to pick you up. Uh, it's generally the wait times are shorter than um, in terms of the fixed route, which I'll come a little bit with a kind of schedule and looking out becomes very hours. Um, so you can put your, your route to where you want to go, to work, to where your friends are going to um, school, and then uh, they tell you where you are going to be picked up. Um, it's a different hotel, hotel, and you go, you do your ride, and then you complete your ride. So that's kind of what um, I'm going to talk And it's really, it's really a, a great tool that now we have because um, it allows to bring more mobility to places that are really difficult to serve with fixed route. So it, it has become a very handy tool. So why not your transit? Well, the first thing is because it addresses or met needs of uh, some population. As I was saying, the fixed route sometimes is very difficult to get in some places because the buses are too big or because there is not enough ridership to have a, an efficient route. Um, it also promotes transportation equity because you can uh, bring it to hard to serve places. And one thing that is really 
important we might get a chance to discuss is the city has um, deficiency in sidewalks and access to pedestrian facilities. Micro microtransit can fulfill that need because they can get closer to where the rider is. And it can be a more convenient and reliable option because typically you can select your trip and you are picked up in 20 to 30 minutes um, and um, you, you can have more controls over your trip which with the demand response or, or with uh, the fixed route you have less control. So here is kind of a comparison of what microtransit does in relationship to other services. So um, demand response, which the city of Rochumont also provides, um, is a service that you can also request on demand, but it has a lot of constraints. So typically the ride can only be um, scheduled 24 hours in advance or the, or the day before. While microtransit, you can schedule it the same day and just the same as your trip. And then, of course, uh, fixed route and the transportation with the companies which are Uber and Lyft. So uh, here you can see that microtransit operates in all the, the realms. Uh, it, it really provides kind of um, services for, for everything. Car pickup service operates in a defined service zone. Um, the trips can be shared with other people and trips must be booked. Advanced, reserva advanced reservation is not required. And um, one thing that is, because microtransit operates mostly with an app, one thing that has been very important is to ensure that the riders that don't have access to electronic can still uh, use the service. So um, microtransit also offers uh, call, um, call centers and you can you can get your ride all in the call center. So it, 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 it has become a very convenient option. Um, here are some examples that are operating in North Carolina. I think one of the most famous one is the one in Wilson. They decided about um, two, two to three years ago to try uh, microtransit in the entire city. And they replaced the entire fixed route service with microtransit. They are right up to Washington. And they were unable to bring the ridership up, so they, they kind of make this, uh, this change. And it has been very successful. And so successful that now they are looking at it again because um, microtransit is also more expensive to operate. So uh, now that the ridership is growing, it's, it's becoming uh, more expensive. Um, there is also service in Morrisville. Uh, and this connects to, it's specifically to Morrisville and connects to uh, Go Triangle service. Um, the Wilmington is kind of a feeder service and they provide um, service outside of the, of the city. Uh, they used to have express routes that were not very efficient, so they, mo they modified those express routes and they replaced them by transit. And then Northeast Wake County, which is kind of closer uh, to you, and they they provide uh, service uh, to the towns in Tebulon um, and those that are kind of in that same area. And they take people to work, to self appointments, to school and, and such. Um, this is a map of where microtransit is being considered in the state. It's, it's in different stages that the, the dark blue is where it's um, implemented. So it's way, um, area and there are many that are kind of in the exploration phase and the planning phase and there are several that are in the exploration phase <coughs> and there has been additional funding from the from the CDP and the federal government so that kind of keeps the the, the, the ball rolling and agencies are looking more and more to see if microtransit is an option that they can consider so Rocky Mount what do we do with microtransit in Rocky Mount? We look first at your system, uh, the 10 routes that, that the city is operating currently, and we look at the ridership. And um, when, when the route is strong route and you have enough ridership, microtransit is an option that will not work because um, you will need 
too many vehicles and it becomes expensive. And this route in that case is a more better option because you can actually do things to improve service and make it stronger. So we looked at which routes uh, were the, let's say the less efficient ones. And we had at the bottom, this is route nine, uh, that goes all the way out to Menash and Edgecon County. And, um, and then following this, it was uh, Route 8, which is the pink, the pink line, and it's this route um, here that goes to the little assemblership, the, the National, uh, National Community College and Little Assembly. And then um, the other one that we look at was the, this green route that is the, is the Route 2, which is on this side of town. There are a couple of very strong routes um, that are uh, Route 5 and Route 7 that go to Golden East and it's sunset. So we began there, we look at the annual ridership, the annual hours, and we look at uh, work in the passenger um, per hour, everything was, and everything that was below 12, we thought that was a candidate for micro transfer. Yes, sir. Uh, we have a question. On the floor. Yes. So I do see the bell photo. So, uh, I see the, the shops for the area. And, uh, and there's uh, the bell for the area. Mm -hmm. uh, and those on the eight from county side. Um, oh, oh, I guess a little bit more in depth. But the shops for the bell. if uh, Todd would answer those questions at the end okay. since he's more familiar with the fixed route system okay. in Marriott. Oh, thank you. Councilman Harris, I think we, we're going to let the presentation roll okay. and then okay. we've got a, another representative, uh, Sir, Mr. Todd. You said it's Todd? Yeah, yeah Todd, he's our uh, transit manager. Okay, yeah, Mr. Todd. Will, um, yeah, so in this chart you can see that the Route 8 and Route 9 are kind of under the 12 passenger per hour, which is kind of our threshold. And also Route 2, and just keep that in your head while I go through. <laughs> uh, we look at demographics, we look at a lot of stuff. Uh, we look at where minorities are, uh, poverty, um, single vehicle households. And here you can see, um, this is a, this is a, a poverty map. Um, when one thing that we thought that was really uh, great for Rocky Mount is that the more vulnerable areas are very well served. So all of them have service, so it's, 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 it's been great. And here there are some, some stats. Um, the people of color, below poverty, below vehicle households, and 65. And these are all um, stats that we consider when we are looking at how to um, Proposed recommendation. We had, as I mentioned before, we had a strong public engagement. We had a survey uh, that was um, filled out by the community and also the riders. We had about 125 community members that responded to the survey and about 25 riders that did as well. We went into the buses and uh, talked to them. And we also had uh, stakeholder focus groups. So we sat with businesses and we sat with educational institutions and with neighborhoods to hear what they had to say. And this is kind of a summary. So um, some of the, the things they said is that there is not sufficient bike and bike infrastructure. Um, they all said that um, public transit fulfills the needs of the citizens and um, that marketing could be stronger so people understand what transit does and how everything is served. And um, everybody said that the expensive service hours was important. And the, so this is from the stakeholder. And from the survey, we got that many people want more service on Saturdays and Sundays. 
and also to extend the hours, longer hours, which was one of the the top three requests. There was here in this microtransit, we had a section that asked specific about microtransit, and people said that they will use the system if available. Uh, most of the people, if you, the community members that responded to the survey, are um, the providers had a loan, and um, most riders walk when transit is not available, and this is actually something that is really important because when we say that riders walk, they may walk five or ten miles mm -hmm. to get to their destination. So it's uh, yeah. Um, work was the primary purpose of the riders, and errands and work were the primary purpose of the public, uh, what they wanted to do. So service recommendations. So and I know this is a lot, um, but what we did, we look at, again, we look at the six routes, and we work on making the six routes stronger. So the routes five and seven that are very good, we left them as they are because we have very good ridership. And the recommendations here are more to increase frequency in the years to come and in not changing the, the routing. Uh, we propose eliminating the Route 9 and replacing all this area with a microtransit zone. So the, the big blurbs that you see here are the microtransit areas that we are proposing for those amounts. So if you keep still your strong six routes and you complement the service with microtransit. So the the first one is the Route 9 that becomes microtransit. Then Route 8, and this, uh, to remind you, this was to the National Community College. What we did here is that we reduced this route, um, and uh, and then the rest of the route that was going to the Community College is replaced by this one. And then um, here in the, in the eastern part, we propose consolidation of several routes and then creating this zone to be able to kind of fill all the areas that may not have six route service. So that way no one loses any coverage when the changes. Because it's, it's for us was really important that coverage is kept because you currently are covering a big surface and you are serving the people that you have to serve. So keeping that coverage was really important. And it was really important for the city as well. This is kind of the, the zoom in in the areas. So here you can see better how these routes get consolidated and how this microtransit zone is uh, replaced. And then um, we have additional recommendations in the report, um, the report that you, that you, uh, that you have. Um, they go into detail of what is proposed, that we are proposing to increase frequency in the stronger routes and um, and to um, add Sundays, uh, later hours and Sunday service, because this were some of the biggest requests from the riders, and also to operate later hours. Currently the service goes from 6.45, 7.15 to about 5.15, um, so increasing the hours for people to be able to make their work trips is going to be important as, as the system goes. Um, we also recommend developing partnerships with employers in the area that could help um, fund in some way the, the transit service and then uh, of course implement and for the microtransit piece, um, in the report we, we provided a very detailed uh, kind of startup schedule. Um, what the city told us that was their preference. There are the different models to microtransit. The preference for the city was to operate and sell microtransit and just acquire software to do so. Um, and so that's kind of the recommendations. And then this is a. Um, Kind of sum summary of the cost. So in the current year, this is this 
keep it cold uh, for a year or two, and then this goes to from 1.7 goes to 2.8 uh, in the first year, and 2.87 in the uh, in the second, and 2.3.1 in phase two. It's a kind of close. Uh, we apply the 2% inflation rate um, to do the the cost. And then uh, phase three, year six, this goes to 3.4, and then phase four, uh, point zero. So it's incremental, and that can give the city opportunity to look for funding um, as well. It's being complemented in all these recommendations. And then, well, the next step is to determine uh, if Marshall Science said is something that the city wants to pursue and to look at the recommendations that we, we propose for six clouds and also uh, for all those. And that's it. Thank you so much for your time and for the presentation. Uh, we've got questions uh, with Councilman as Councilman Dr. Um, the data you use was for 29 things. Yes. You know what 20, 21, 22, and the impacts of have you looked at any recent data for the last year for 23? So and should we look at more current ridership in order to make the best decision as possible? So um, when we look at the ridership, we saw that the ridership declined tremendously in, during the COVID period, but then began increasing. So. When we were performing the study, the ridership was almost at the same level that it was before. Um, and this study was done, uh, I think it began last year. Um, so the best data at the time of the 2019, because we don't want we, we don't want to consider the COVID data because it's completely uh, you know out of the norm. So we are doing still studies with the 2019 because it's a, it's, it's kind of the most standard normal uh, set of data that we have. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there is no charge currently for riders. Is that correct? No, no sir. But uh, we, we currently are charging riders. You, you have just started? No, we started uh, a couple of years ago. That's long ago. Yes, no. Well, that was my next question. Uh, I know we got a lot to do, mm -hmm. but how do you see the cost of the fixed route by ride to Sunset, etc., which is a heavily traveled route? With that cost to a rider who needs micro transit, would it be comparable, or how are the other cities handling that? Well, that's, that's kind of a difficult question because. When you think about transit, right now the people that use transit are people that really need to really need transit to be able to do their life. So um, thinking about the fares that you're going to charge, it has to be something that um, is aligned with kind of the income levels. Um, we see across the board that the fares are same as the fixed routes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Wilson, I think, is a little more expensive, and they use that as a tool to manage the demand. Um, but again, you you need to look at what is your, you know, what how much money are you bringing with your with your fares, and determine if that's really what you want to do. Last question: Did you go out to Westland to, to do any studies of students? I know. There was a slide about trying to get Westland maybe to kick in some money, et cetera. But is there a need for ridership from Rocky Mountain out to Westland University? Um, I, I believe they were part of the focus groups. Um, so we didn't see in, in this study the need for that at this point. And, and I think if there is consideration to do it, um, the college should be brought in. To, you know, to determine what that is, um, and see if they can contribute. There are some other cities that are doing that sort of stuff. Um, Greenville has done the, done the road between that. They are um, working with 
ICU to see if they can partner and provide better service in both the students and the physicians. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, I'll pick up what Tom left off about pricing strategies and using it. So is this like, this is like a group of, is it similar to, or how, how does a consumer book the trip? So the consumer can book in, in a couple of ways. Um, they can have a, an app on their phone and same as Uber, you get there, it, it reads your location, and you say where you want to go. And so the, the software allocates the trip and they tell and they tell you a bus is gonna pick you up at this location. It can be and for for microtransit you can do two things. You can have the bus to pick you up kind of where you are, or the the agency can set up a, what they call virtual stops. So you have a stop where people are gonna congregate that is close to the area um, where they are requesting their trip. Um, so that's the first the first way, and another way to book the trip is calling, uh, and that all the agencies that are doing microtransit and um, implementing microtransit, all of them have the call center because it's really important that riders that don't have a cell phone have access to transit because at the end that's being paid with federal funding, federal dollars, and for the federal government it's really important that they open to the public and that it's accessible by the public. So when the, when the ride is booked, the government payment is extended and it's payment made by the consumer when they get into the vehicle? So most um, systems, they allow you to pay in advance. So you can purchase trips in advance and they get deducted. Um, like a card or something? Yeah, okay. yeah. It can even be um, virtual if you are using online and it just gets deducted from, like you have a balance in your account and it gets deducted every time you use it. Um, but thinking about the on-bank um, riders as well, there should be an option for them to pay cash. Um, so when we design a an RFP, how will we provide those options so that we would not compare them apples to apples, oranges to oranges. How will we design that? Well, um, when you design the RFP, you really have to put there everything that you want. And that's something that we have seen with other agencies. Um, so that when, when this microtransit began, the, the company, I mean, and this is if you decide to go with the, another company, because if you are going for software, it's a different, um, kind of a different way of doing it. Um, but you have Can to you put- say with another company, explain that to me? Oh, so so there, there. Are two, there are two ways to provide micro chances. Okay. One is to what they call turnkey, that you hire a company. Um, there are several out there, Ecolane, Via, um, Ride, there are, there are several. So um, you can provide turnkey, so you hire, or you contract out your service, and they provide everything, the vehicles, the drivers, the software, everything. That's kind of one way. Um, there is another way that is that you as the agency provide the service, um, but you acquire the software, because you are gonna need that app, right? Or even the call center to be able to do it. And uh, so um, you can just purchase the software and the, the TV pool. So is this the option that we are, that's being recommended to us? Is that what you're saying? The option that's being recommended is that the city provide the service and purchase the software. Uh, well, we didn't make a recommendation about <laughs> what the city should do, but uh, we understand that that's the city's preference because um, the city already provides demand response uh, which is similar, but without the app. And so the city knows how to do it. Um, and, um, and 
the only thing that they still need is the software to be able to operate the microtransfers in full fashion. And uh, but to your question, that what needs to be in the RFP, it, you need to put in the RFP everything that you want, because otherwise. Um, So that's so okay. Thank you for clearing that up because I really only thought there was one option. I did not re realize that we were looking at doing this ourselves. So then um, you're saying then the vendor, if we go RFP route, um, would provide us with a com with an estimate of what they think their costs would be um, related to operating the whole system and delivering it on behalf of the city. Mm -hmm. And then the city of Rocky Mountain, if we chose to do so, would just purchase software and reconfigure our <coughs> system delivery mm -hmm. so that perhaps we put more emphasis or additional emphasis on microtransfers mm -hmm. for the district. Yeah. And that way we might already assume what levels of cost there are because of our ridership. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I have several questions, so just work okay. with me. Thank you. So do federal funds cover revenue gaps if we are unable to, if we cannot make the system operational, which I don't think we do on the kick side, with fares that are collected at the, at the Yeah, at so the, the federal, the, the city already received federal funding. Right. Um, that federal funding is not going to change dramatically unless something dramatically changes in the system. Um, and um, there has been, a, so Wilson has some operating assistance with an innovation grant. That's how they pay, I think, first two years. It was that federal funding and some assistance from the CDOTD and also local funding, of course. Um, but that was, that was just a couple of years. So the city is gonna need to find how to make up for that revenue. And I mean, there are- Are we estimating, do we know enough now to estimate what the gap would be? Yes, and we, and we provided all these numbers in the report. Okay. So did I, see, did I see it on? Did you yeah, see? I was going to ask if you, if you don't mind. No, is, that, is, is that in addition to the two million two hundred fifty one thousand, like we received or we approved tonight to use for? We got two million from the federal government, and we had to match it with I think it's two hundred fifty thousand. So that's our current. If, if I'm following what you're saying, mm -hmm. so that's our current, and then these costs are in addition to that. Is my understanding? So no, this is. All the service. So our current service plus the micro. Yeah, it's worth the funding. Does okay. that, that yeah. answer you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we're saying that we can operate this within our existing budget. Um, no. <laughs> so you, your seven is going to cost four million. Okay, right. Yeah. So my question is mm -hmm. so we have to have a strategy yes. that complements yeah. this shift and this change. That the, we don't know what it would be if we privatized part of it because we haven't had. Yeah, and the other thing, um, so NCDOT has also been providing assistance for microtransfers. Um, they, there is a program that is called CONCEPT and if, the, if there is a kind of a partnership between agencies, for instance, the county or the city or some other county, it, they, the city could access um, that funding source as well. But it's also limited. All, all the operating funding is limited in nature. Um, in the report, we also talked about the, the um, quarter cent self tax. Um, so the, the General Assembly allows any county in the state to charge a quarter cent tax uh, for transfers. And some agencies are using that um, in, in the Triangle area, uh, Charlotte is using it. That, and for 
agencies that want to grow their chunks of service, that has been the most reliable way to do it. Um, yeah. That's an additional just for transit? It's yes. just for transit. Okay. It's quarter cent extra just for transit. Never ever heard that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I can I ask clarification? Because that you mentioned county, is it only is the legislature only allows the counties yeah. or allows the cities? The counties. So we would have to go to other counties and ask yeah. <laughs> yeah, for which yeah. we provide transportation. Yeah. We're right. providing those services. Right. Yeah. We're providing those services. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I got two more questions then okay. then I'll let you go. Um so can you explain can you pull this that slide back up about the areas where you recommended micro transit be provided? So so micro transit will replace some fixed routes or do they operate together? So, uh, <laughs> yes, so the Route 9, it replaces the Route 9. We don't have any piece of Route 9. The Route 9 is it's the one that goes to the north. Um, okay. yeah. um, on the, this, this one here, what we did, and then you open up two more questions. <laughs> yeah, so the, what, we did here was to, what we did here was to shorten the Route 8. Mm -hmm. The Route 8 currently goes this way, all the way here to the Nash Community College. Um, so we shortened this route, and all this area was transferred to Route 8. To the and then on Route 10, uh, we consolidated a couple of routes here and here, and then the areas that the, where we remove the fixed route, we put the micro transit so no one uses service. Okay. So what is the in other places? In other places, what is the average wait time between the well, you could call it 24 hours. You told us that, but how long if you call if I have an appointment somewhere? Do I have to call 24 hours in advance, or I can call how many minutes or hours prior to me needing the service? So that would depend on how you negotiate your contract with the provider. But the um, principle of micro transit is that it should be close enough to your trip, like 30 minutes, perhaps. You know, because you, if you want to make your offer on time, you know that you're gonna have at least 20 minutes wait time for to, to get on the bus. And uh, so you, you have to negotiate the, that threshold with your, the provider, but the user should call at least one hour before. Okay, so at least an hour in advance. And if the provider is the city, then and I guess I have to ask Ty, what's the strategy for uh, wait time management? We would, we would have to work that out once we implement the system. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, micro transit is, is, is foreign to us right now. But once we if we decided to um, just go with the city providing the service and we just purchased the software, then those things would, would have to be worked worked out. Mm -hmm. If if I have to say preliminary, if I have to guess, I would say we would just um, manifest it to where they would have to call at least an hour or make a make at least an hour before mm -hmm. they have to be at their at their that appointment. Okay. Which right now the way we run the service, you know, it's a twenty four hour, you know, so basically as far as time that would be a vast improvement. And so, so will this do away with the bands that no. so we so we would be operating still the buses, the bands, and now we add another line of service with the micro so you keep saying buses, so that's the vehicle that would be used. So you have to wait for the bus to be full for that one hour, or you know, it, if we if we implement micro micro transport, we do smaller things. Smaller vehicles. So you might have yeah. a family or one person that it, it would not matter. Uh, well, right now, <clears throat> if we were to implement it, we would use we would use our existing vehicles. We might have to utilize some uh, grant allocations to buy additional vehicles to accommodate um, the micro transit service. But right, the way we're thinking now, we would we would use our the bands that we have now for that market transfer. So it still would be a shared rider concept. Yes, sir. So you try to put as many people in there within your route. Or yes, sir. 
this and, 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 and with this with this with this service you'll probably have at the most maybe two 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 passengers um, for uh, maybe per hour for the for those trips. Okay. Yeah, and we've got some of the examples of the vehicles that are operated in the state. So they are smaller Last question that I had, um, I did not see where there was any conversation with health care facilities. Um, I think we invited them to the focus group. I mean, and no one showed up? We probably didn't see what happened. Yeah, we, we had a big list of stakeholders. So the ones that you have in the report are the ones that um, show up to our meetings. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you. Uh, I've got a question. I'm just part of the if I'm originating in, we call it a microtransit zone, and I need to go to some other section or fix the bus route, how does that work? I make a phone call, transit comes and picks me up, then they drop me off on a bus route, bus stop, or do they take me to my final destination? Um, so everything depends on how it's set up. Okay. So I think once the, if the software is acquired and you look at the capacity of the system, Mr. Todd, as well. Well, you were, oh, go right I'm sorry. No, I was just, she, you know, you, you said there was a list, and I didn't see the list. That's all. It's mm -hmm. not as okay. I didn't see it. Okay. Are you no. in the report? No, I don't see it. It's a stakeholder. Oh, it's in the, in the report. Okay, but I don't have it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, can we get the report? Man, I'd like to see the full report, please. Yeah, yeah, I can uh, tell us where we can. Yeah. Um, I think, um, Mr. Todd, how do you feel, you know, working already, how do you feel about the potential changes, the possible changes, and, you know, how do you feel your department will be able to um, be flexible to the changes if, if this is going to be an implemented change? Well, I, I think uh, we could be very flexible um, by going the route of providing the service ourselves purchasing the software, I think that we have one leg up because even though we don't, we do not provide microtransit right now, we provide demand response. And so we're really, really familiar with how to provide um, that type of transportation. And if we add, it, if we add this component to it, um, because like she mentioned, like the call center, you know, we are, we already do that. Um, we're, 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 fit, we're, we're getting ready to implement where uh, passengers can use an app to pay their fares. We're getting ready to implement that. So once once all those things fall into place, when we, if we add a component of microtransit, I think that we'll be prepared um, to do that. There, there will be some, some barriers as far as we will probably need additional vehicles and things of that nature and additional funding to sustain the service. But those things can be figured out, but I think that, but I think it can work within those, within the zones that were stated in the presentation. No, I think, like, uh, Earl, thank you uh, for that, too. I just want to get your thoughts about it, you know, from the people working with them. Uh, uh, I think Council and Fabian brought up earlier, you know, uh, potentially this may be an RFP situation. Would that be um, partiality RFP uh, to some of the developer, I mean, um, uh, delivery services that we already have, transportation services that are already um, in existence, and they will work directly with your department, I'm assuming. Mr. Right. If, if we go the route of just purchasing the software, that uh, 
at least the RFP would be this being the option. The only other option would be, um, and another thing that we have to remember is NCDOT and FTA are really pushing, especially NCDOT, they're really pushing um, transportation systems within the state um, to implement microtransit. And as a part of that, um, number one, they 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 will be um, releasing the RFP from a from a state from the state level to which um, transit systems can piggyback on to um, implement software or to purchase software, which would negate the RFP service. Well, I mean the RFP uh, process. Oh, so wow. that's that that's that's one option that we can look at um, down the road. So that it wouldn't be like a rule like you know transit still has micro transit. Right, it'll, it'll just be, it'll either be an RFP or we, we piggyback on, uh, on a state contract just to purchase the software and then we can, we can, operate, this, we can operate the service um, as we sit fit, at, which will work better for the citizens here. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Councilman Knight and uh, <coughs> Councilman Ross, thank you for being We already provide transportation for those for those citizens that need that transportation to those particular areas um, um, through our rural general public program. Um, but um, micro transit can surely be implemented to provide um, as an additional um, mode of transportation for those citizens citizens as well. So um, you know we like for example Universal League um, right now. for um, passengers to go and, and work, work in, in those areas. So we're already providing that transportation. This, this could be an added, an added component okay. to, to do so. Thank you. Well, I think the microtransit is exciting just for the sheer fact that we have a lot of folks that, as Councilman Mike indicates, needs to get to their, to their job. And I think the disclosure deployment, I, I would say that's probably a, a big plus. In addition to folks being able to get to the grocery store because if you have to go to the fixed route, I think round trip is, you know, what, what is the round trip like if you were, if, if you had to, you know, walk from your house that's a mile away from your closest bus stop, wait for the bus that comes every hour, then go to the closest grocery store, get your bags, get back into the bus, and then walk another mile. I mean, just that alone, I can see saving a lot of time and then the perishables that you have to buy and then the, the toll on the family. So I, I certainly see a plus in that. Um, and then going back to the fleet mixture, would we do away with any of our buses or would we keep the amount, the amount of buses we have because the buses are expensive and I assume they're expensive to operate and the, and the smaller vehicles are probably less expensive and a little more um, versatile and get around <coughs> smaller neighborhoods easier. Did y'all hit on that any, or would our costs shift a little bit? Uh, our thought would be we would keep our existing, mm -hmm. our existing fleet, and if need be, we would, we would just add um, more vehicles to accommodate the micro transit concept. We would probably purchase, if we were to do that, we would probably purchase, um, um, I can't say how many, but we would probably purchase smaller vehicles in order to um, best serve um, or best, you know, so we would keep our existing fleet, but if anything, we would just add to it. So, and then going to the software that you mentioned, that you currently have, is that a module that you can add on, or would you have to buy completely new software that would work together with what we currently have? We would probably just have to, we would have to, um, there are, 
various vendors out there that that um, have the market transit that I translated. They specialize in market transit software. And so basically, um, right now we have software that that we utilize to to conduct our business the way we do now. But it would just be an added um, software um, for the for the market transit. Well, I, I think this is exciting if we can if we can make this work because I, I do think this is. Economic development, quite frankly, and um, you know, take care of or address a lot of issues with employment as well as um, folks that can really support transportation. They have to make their lives a lot easier, quite frankly. So hopefully, we can work on this. And, and I would like to, like everyone else, see the, the study. And, um, I am curious that some people. Let's also don't forget the small employers as well, mm -hmm. because small employers need folks working just as badly in, in the, as the large companies, and some of the main issues are people not able to not have transportation to yeah. their jobs. Mm -hmm. system people being discharged and can't get to that appointment and I'm hoping that this will be able to address some of that because I know that's more of an individual need for getting to those appointments. The other thing is that school system is bringing in a lot of teachers now that is not from this area and bringing to even other places and those teachers are coming without transportation. I don't know if we talk to the school system or not about uh, how we can help move some of that traffic around uh, with this service. And uh, uh, I know that Sarah Lee has always been struggling with transportation as well in the state. And I know you don't go out of course we do, but you know, we have a lot of people that cannot get to those places because of the distance, and uh, so, so I don't know if we can look at it, because uh, Brother E should get the places get a little bit out there. So I'm hoping that we can, we won't be able to solve all the problems, but I'm hoping that we can look at a more deliberate process. So like you just, like Councilman Jordan just said, <coughs> setting a meeting today with Universal Leaf. I guess how can the people who are struggling to get to work, how can they know about that? I guess the transit can, if they do stay in Rocky Mountain, we'll take them to Universal Leaf. So what's some ways I guess we can I guess get that information out to those people? Um, like I said, we set a meeting today and I asked and it was never said. So I know that would be important and very helpful. Right. For a lot of people who are looking for employment. Uh, with Universal Lee and Sarah Lee, because uh, yeah. they said the same thing. Yeah. So, what ways, I guess, can we get that information out to those people to let them know that this service is provided? Well, <clears throat> the service is provided through what we call our rural general purpose program, which can, you can um, access through uh, Charter the Transit website, and it'll, it'll tell you all about how our rural general program and how, how, that, and how that works. Um, transportation to and from Sara Lee and also um, Universal Lee um, is is through that that program. Mm -hmm. We also provide it through our, our evening shuttle because we provide the evening shuttle from 6 p.m. to um, 12 a.m. Okay. And so we have a lot of passengers that utilize the uh, evening shuttle um, um, for those places as well. So okay. that information can be accessed um, through our website. That's um, not there's a link. There's a link to. There's a link to the website on the on the city website as well. So, um, but but you know we a lot of our a lot of our market strategy is is is, is word of mouth really because you know we have so many people that, that we transport to and from Sarah Lee and and also Universal Leaf and and they they tell one person they tell another person and so you know that 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 is a, a useful tool but. We're definitely looking at other ways to get that information out because that service is available. 
And I think, like, I think maybe somewhere, I guess, a weekend. Find a way, like, those kind of, like, universities, the Sarah Lees, the McLeans, who will take a chance on, like, the re-entry type people who are just getting out looking for a chance. If we can, I guess, find a way to market it with those companies to let them know that these things are available would be very important. Um, because a lot of people, like, say when you go in, like, this morning with the re-entry population, main thing is the thing, like, they don't have a ride at the university. You know, they're just trying to lay their head, provide for their family. So I think one of those things would be very important if they could find a way to get back and forth would be very helpful until they can get on their feet. So I guess maybe if it's a way we can partner even from the city with those type of companies and let them know to app to pretty much market that that they that the transit does provide rides would be very helpful and important, especially to that population of people. Exactly. And we and we can um talk the transit team can reach out to those uh, okay. those those companies themselves our, ourselves and let them and let them know that that service is available so they can then um portray that to their employees. Okay. So we, that's one way of doing that as well. Also we run into them too do we want want us to refer them back to you? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. That concludes our questions for uh, this agenda item. Thank you so much for your presentation, Mrs. Sherry. I mean, we are excited about the potential and possibilities of microtransit in the city of Arkansas. <laughs> Next on our agenda, we have presentation of crime stats and incentives from our very own chief pastor. Thank you, Rebel Jim. I got a question. I got to go back. Um, chief, I noticed that um, you came not to share with the council or the public about what's happening in the city. Um, we do a press release for everything that happened. This slide represents our aggravated assault and shootings occupied um, 
dwelling for uh, vehicle cases and investigations. Had a total of cases, 66 in quarter three, a total of 82 victims. 12 cases had multiple victims, 18 arrests, and 27 cases were cleared by arrest. This slide represents our shots fired numbers in the city. Uh, just remember the top is our quarterly numbers, the bottom is our year to date numbers. And I'm going to go through each one of those unless someone has any particular questions. Say it again. So, so the top is quarter three. So, okay. for example, here shots fired occurred. Um, there's 241 shots fired calls or in the city, either called in by shot spotter or um, alerted by shot spotter or a citizen called it in. And for the year, 651. So bottom is year to date, top is quarter, quarter three. Uh, just need some uh, more information on how shots fired um, throughout the city. 31 more shots fired calls between quarter two and quarter three. <coughs> 210 to 241, year to date 16% increase for 90 more calls than last year. This slide is a variety of statistics um, that we collect from our 911 center and the police department. Um, same as the previous slide on shots fired, the top is our quarterly numbers. I apologize, I should have been louder. The bottom is our year to date numbers. So for example, we had 26,146 calls for service in quarter three, year to date 77,500. I want to go through each one of those unless there was any specific question. I just so wanted to give us a drop from, So is that a drop from last year? I did not compare these numbers to last year. Um, I, I don't want to say unless I actually look at okay. it. Okay. Chief. If call for service, is that strictly just for the RPD or is that include the fire department when we approach you know, the EMT calls? Is that actually done? Yes, sir, it does. About 20,000 of those calls are police calls, so the remainder will be our fire EMS calls. Fire and their first response EMS calls. EMS type call where the rescue is actually dispatched okay. goes straight to the camera. Okay. So 20,000 of the 26 will be police, and the remainder will be. Uh, violent crime and apprehension team. Uh, these are overall stats for quarter three. 74 uh, warrant or arrest made, 15 citations, drug seizure in that quarter, and they did seven search warrants predominantly within our shot spot area. I want to highlight our, you know, we're doing exceptionally well, I still believe, in our community engagement, um, in community engagement throughout the city. These numbers are looking at our projects or events that we actually put on ourselves or events that we're invited to. For example, Edgemont community to have an event, it's their event, but they want the police to be there for some kind of engagement opportunity. That will fall up under the attended. Initiated is an activity or events that our community engagement coordinator, Mr. Ron and Stick, can actually put on for on behalf of the police department. But for this quarter, we had a total of 33 events that we've attended or we put together ourselves for a total of 251 collective, so sometimes staff go to multiple events, of course, 251 staff members are involved in these uh, 33 events, with an estimated 6,578 citizen contacts, which is very important uh, because we do know with community engagement involvement, they help build relationships, relationships built on trust because they're engaging with our officers in the community. So that's why having our community engagement coordinator has been very beneficial for us and we're still pushing our community efforts. Virtual call center, that was something that started back in July 1st of this year. Wanted to give you a, a little predictive, not predictive, early numbers on that. These are the civilians that sit in a room and they take all the non-police response needed type calls for service in our city. Um, so just January 1st, not even being fully staffed, we just hired the last three individuals um, over the last few weeks. I think one may have went to orientation today. I think it was. The very first today? Monday. Last Monday. But we just got fully staffed and they already took 258 calls. Uh, 186 hours 
which we're estimating from when an officer would have gone on the scene to clear that call, so approximately 86 hours. And here's a breakdown of the type of calls that are taken to predominantly larceny type reports. Larceny is where there is no suspect information, um, and they just need to file a report. These type of reports are given to our civilian staff to take. The second largest will be a financial type crime. Now, saying that, they don't mean they don't investigate the crime. They take the report, and then it's assigned to an investigator to follow the citizen on the investigative part of that. But now that they're fully staffed, hopefully the next quarter will be much, much larger than that. So this is like a, it's not, that's not a 911 call? Now, how do they get to call? That's a good question. Thank you, sir. They can get there in multiple ways. Um, they, if a citizen calls 911, it still goes to our 911 center. Um, but then once they take all the information, they realize it's one of the calls that do fall up under the personal call center, it's transferred down to the center. Uh, if a citizen um, calls the administrative line, that can be either picked up by the 911 center administrative line or our main police department number. Once they understand what the citizen is requesting, is transferred to the virtual call center, and we still have citizens that walk in the door. Um, so if they walk into the door, we have a desk, a kiosk kind of station in the side lobby, a secondary lobby, where they can sit down with more privacy, um, and the person from the virtual call will come down, um, and then once the phone is installed, they'll be able to communicate with them on the phone. Thank you. Yes, sir. Here's a list of the activities that we participated in in quarter three. Um, throughout the city, so 33 types. I'll put some of the main ones up there for you. On our, on our recruitment and retention efforts, I wanted to just start off with some of the efforts that we did in recruitment of new staff. Um, we attended to multiple job fairs, Nash Community College, Edgecombe Community College. We've been to um, Fort Bragg, we've been to North Carolina Central. We have a lot of graduates from Central, so we did took, up, um, took advantage of the opportunity to better take some along back to the university and talk with some of the students about the great opportunity we have uh, here at Rocky Mountain. We still participate and have a lot of interns that come to the department from Wesleyan, East Carolina, and Chapel Hill, which is a great opportunity for them to learn more about the police department and hopefully look at a career here in law enforcement. Social media campaigns, community outreach events, the team approach, getting every officer to understand the value of word of mouth. Um, we can put out as many campaigns as we want. Sometimes just having someone you know um, in the in your face, a friend or associate of a friend, to be able to talk about the police department. So that's what we call team approach. Um, news coverage, the hiring bonuses for police and E911 center, recruitment incentives, um, streamlining our processes. That's what I want to highlight that. Uh, we looked at our own process of how from when they make an application to HR to when it's given to my staff, to the first interview board, to the polygraph, the lie detector test, the background, the psychological exam, where was it that we may have been the times where they extended, where could we have shortened that up? Because we understand from day one, when they put the application in, it's a race. Who can get to the individual board first? And we wanted to make sure we change our interaction with our applicants or potential applicants to make them feel more wanted. Making sure there's repeated and constant follow-up from our recruiters with that individual, keeping them informed all the way through the process. So when I talk about streamlining, we cut the time down as much as we could, and we also made it a more one-on-one -on -one type experience with, these, with our applicants. Um, lateral entry, we really pushed that hard in recruiting individuals who were looking for a different atmosphere, a different in location to serve the community. Recruitment video went out a few months back, which was very positive, and then of course it um, increased out. You can't have a vibrant department without also remembering we got to focus on retention, and this is what we did in our retention efforts. Uh, we looked at our parents' um, policy, made you know, a number of revisions from allowing beards down to having tattoos that be visibly shown. Um, these are things that it regards to one's opinion, but the majority in our society, these things are more acceptable now. We are recruiting from our community, so we want to make sure that not only we're looking at our department to be more diverse as far as ethnicity, but also in appearance as much as we can and still maintain that professional appearance of an officer. So the changes, beard, tattoos, um, was more of a change that will be um, more accepting for people when they 
decide to come to the law enforcement profession. Career development ladders were enhanced. Incentive pay for specialized positions. These are individuals who are uh, in like FTO training, they have trainers that train our new officers or new communicators. These are individuals who are on our special response team or SWAT. Um, so if you were on these special units, you're doing your regular job and an additional duty, there was an incentive pay offered to them. Recruitment incentive for officers who recommend someone who actually apply and get hired. There was an incentive for them. Our mental health and wellness act, we want to put more emphasis on the well-being of our officers. So we launched the White House app, which we push out a lot of resources to help officers know what's available to them, not only our EAP, but our 1-800 number to the cop line with 24-hour access every day of the year. If they need to speak with somebody, they can get help through calling that number. Um, night differential pay, new uniform and exterior vest carriers, new technology that help make the job a little bit easier and more streamlined, and then additional support staff like the virtual call center to help take some of the pressures off our officers in the field. What has that produced for us? Back in January, we had 52 vacancies in the department, and for 21 and 22, when we say negative hiring, that means we had more individuals leaving than coming in. Individuals were leaving for retirements, getting out of the professional totally, going to other agencies. But for whatever that reason, we had more officers leaving our agency. We were hiring people. We just had more going out than coming in. I will also make a note there that you know, in our state, a couple of years ago, I was in a meeting that not really was made for public, but there was numbers shared with me and the rest of the members of that, of that group. That as a whole in the profession, it seemed like there was more people leaving our profession than actually going into the police academies. Uh -huh. Those were individuals who were wanting to go in law enforcement. There was more going and leaving our profession than actually going into the police academy to join our profession. So 52 vacancies back in January, which equates to about 30%, to now, at the end of October, 15 vacancies, with 13 new police recruits are in the police academy as we speak. Um, we already are starting our new police academy, which is coming up hopefully in January. Um, positive hiring for the first time year to date, or year to date uh, for this year, whereas we had negative, more people leaving and coming in, we actually have for the first time more individuals coming in the agency and more people staying within our agency than before. Uh, with that, Chief. Yes, sir. Question. I'm sorry, I got a couple of errors. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Yes, sir. Uh, we'll so, 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 is there any type of guidelines around the beard and the hair? Yes, sir. Um, don't quote me to this, but I want to say it's like three quarters of an inch on the beard. Um, it can't be like four or five inches or anything. Um, you can't do anything much with it, but a nice, solid beard. Um, um, same with the mustache and the sideburns, all of, within some inches or a quarter of an inch. Hey, what's wrong with the beard? <laughs> <laughs> Several months back, you mentioned a new policy where some officers can take a patrol car home. Yes, sir. How many officers have been able to take that patrol car home? Over and above the number prior to the The last report I got on that was around 20 officers in the city to take a car home. Well, that's got to yeah. help with re redemption. It, it, it does. It makes it very convenient for officers who live, and that's for officers who live in the city. Right. Now, some officers do take cars home who are either on call in the investigative division, uh, or it's a continuous duty type deal. Um, they work. They work today. They work tomorrow. They can take their car home. But for those who have currently assigned cars, it was around 20 in my last time I got an update about that program. But it is beneficial. And I think it does help with retention. So there's one thing that keeps you up at night. What is it? Making sure that as the police chief, that the men and women of Rock Mountain Police Department know I'm here for them, and that I'm able, and that I'm able, which I have been able to do that, provide what they need to do their job and be safe and go home to their families. Is there anything technology-wise, uh, license plate readers more, or anything that we can 
help even more with your... No, sir. We have a few projects already in, in the works now um, that has, that's come from the manager's office that's already been went through the proper procedure. So, no, sir. We're just moving those projects forward as fast as we can, which is going to dramatically help us as far as technology. Okay. Hey, with some of your DeCrom statistics chat up there, and do we have the same offenders over and over? And if so, I mean, I'm sure you're communicating with you know, um, the judicial system. And what what is being done and not being done? What we, you know, if you, similar to what Councilman Harris was talking about, if we had a magic wand, what, 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 what could be done? Because I think, based on some previous presentations, that's my assumption that we have some of the issues. We do have repeat offenders. Um, of course, those repeat offenders, if, for example, felonious offenses, of course, third strike job still is there. We work with our district attorney's office to make sure that they get the more tougher sentences if they are on that third felony or not. Um, but then some of these individuals that you may see that um, they are reoffending or misdemeanors, which don't do the three strike get out of the felony, but there may be other services that I think they need as whether it's mental health um, or maybe domestic related issues, constant arguments with people in the neighborhood. Um, we're just gonna have to make sure that when we identify these individuals that need additional services <coughs> um, like mental health, um, that we get them to the right community partner to get it to. Um, so for me, that's what I think we need to do on the repeat offenders piece. And if there was one ask I would have is to make sure that we as a police department continue to work with our community partners to get them or identify the individuals that we see need their service <coughs> and then hopefully they'll deliver on that for us. Um, so that's my biggest ask there is if there is a community partner out there that I'm not aware of, please make sure they bring themselves to my attention uh, and I know and understand what they provide. So when I come across a need in the city that's dealing with potential small offenders, I can make sure I can make that connection. And we have done that through a number of groups in our city. So I'm, I know we're entering into the holiday season and a lot of thefts and breaking and entering from malls and different stuff. Um, um, I guess what we're doing about trying to educate people on that, the other one is, I know from the homeless shelter, we're seeing an increase uh, in homelessness in Rocky Mountain uh, and definitely in some neighborhoods. We're seeing a lot more people in, in, you know, going into a home, the last day the home is trying to stay. Um, and a lot of, do you see a growth in the juvenile crime or, or juvenile entering crime? Do you, how, what does that look like? We are seeing an increase in the number of juvenile offenders. We saw that last year. 21 and 2022, um, and that's still somewhat trending the same with the number of juvenile offenders. Um, and those offenders, we are making sure we make those connections in juvenile court to other out programs that may benefit them. I am excited that I am working on something else um, with the state as far as grant funding to help identify juvenile offenders and what we can do with juvenile offenders and other needs in our community when it comes to crime. So hopefully in the future, I will have some exciting <coughs> on that. Um, but we are seeing an increase in the number of juveniles committing crime in our city. So I think that's a trend you're seeing um, in other cities as well. I think it was the first part of your question. Yeah, the homeless piece. Uh, I know we're seeing an increase in that. Uh, are, you, are you guys having to deal much with that? Occasion have individuals who are either transient, they somehow make their way to Rocky Mount and they have nowhere to go, so they find their way in my front lobby. Um, and when that happens, we do make sure we connect them with the homeless shelter. Um, then, for some of the individuals who really the homeless shelter is not where their end destination was supposed to be, we work with community groups to try to get them the necessary bus ticket or train ticket to go to their final destination by like a family member 
Um, please don't take that. I am not pushing no one. <laughs> because I have been in places where I have seen that happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where across the state line, they just popped up in my in the city I was at at the time. These are individuals who just, for some reason, they got off the train or a bus here, or they found themselves here, and they're trying to get home to a family member, and we have groups in our city <coughs> who have helped pay for those tickets to get them there. Mm -hmm. Well, we did anything to try to decrease some of those malls breaking in or people leaving second car and leaving. <laughs> yes, sir. We still do the report card um, initiative where we put, if we go and um, we see valuables in cars, we'll put a little note, please remove valuables from inside your car. We don't touch the handles anymore, but the car will talk about locking your vehicles as, you know, a previous slide, what, 20, no, 43 of the cars, of those numbers of lost from cars were unlocked meaning they didn't have to forcibly go in them. Uh, we have had incidents where, you know, we could look at video footage of parking lots and people just go and pull on handles. So increase our efforts in putting the cars, reminding people uh, to lock your vehicle, keep the values out of eyesight. We are starting the After 9 campaign as a campaign that's been around for a while, but we haven't had it here in Rocky Mount. Basically a social media campaign from my PIO for the department to remind people Lock your doors and your cars, your houses, just be mindful of that and keep the values out of eyesight. Um, so hopefully between the two initiatives, we can increase public awareness to remove or ride the lock your vehicles. Because larceny is about driving faggot, and, and from the vehicle, larceny from the vehicle is one of the biggest ones for stroke is driving up our property crime. Thank you so much, Chief. Uh, appreciate you for your presentation for, for your Department of men and women that continue to serve, protect us. Thank you, and thank you for everyone participating. If there are no other questions at this time, I know thank you for the faith based meeting that you've been having. The clergy really appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. We're gearing up for our next meeting all in November. I uh, already have a few updates and requests for those. So, anyone have any requests, updates before uh, November? Let's get started on those. Hearing nothing else, thank you all so much for attending this Committee of the Whole. The meeting October 23rd, 2023. I now adjourn this meeting.